I, silly. I turned it on. Well, we never have these hats like this. Like, I feel silly in a hat this big. So it's not, it's not a big hat. Well, compared to... I see big hats. My hat's way different than yours. That's okay. You guys it have... should be. Character. You Your hat has... Every hat has character. I don't know. Except for flat-brimmed baseball caps. They have no character. No character, whatever. No. I see people in the chat the room. So that means we must be live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Torn Tuesday. I'm Justin, and I'm in Denver. No, go. I'm in Morrison. Which is outside Denver. We're at the Morrison Museum of Natural History. Or the Morrison Natural History Museum. Or the Morrison Mu Mu Natural History Museum. It works. And uh, we're going to talk to these guys about dinosaurs because they were on National Geographic Television last week talking about dinosaurs. So if they're good enough for Nat Geo, they're good enough for Tolkien fans. Almost good enough for Tolkien fans. Yeah. So, my name is Justin. Welcome to the show. We're do, we do this every Tuesday, 5 p.m. Pacific. If you're just joining us, Cliff will be back next week because I will be back in L.A. where we're going to do a whole tribute to Christopher Lee, who just passed away yes. this last weekend. He had oh, 100 films. Man, yeah. Christopher Lee. He had over 80 films. And he was in all of the Lord of the Rings films. And uh, what a guy. So well respected by his peers, but it's Alan. By everybody, mm -hmm. we've reached out to all the actors. We've reached out to all of the filmmakers that uh, he worked with on Lord of the Rings, and uh, we've got some replies back. So we're gonna we're gonna get a little more information, a little more feedback uh, from everybody, and uh, we'll have a great tribute next week on Torn Tuesday. We're gonna go through his whole career. Because you can't just spend a segment mm -hmm. with Christopher Lee. Yeah, I mean, he'll, he'll, he could take it. Unlike some other actors who perhaps are even more famous in a trivial way, he was not a backstabber. No. He was the gentleman of gentlemen, yes. and there's so many stories. Classically trained. Classically trained. So I see people in the chat room right now. Uh, Spirited Books. Uh, a lot of our regulars. Eruvandi. Hello, everybody. So, I... I'm up here because I'm helping, I was helping out this museum uh, this weekend, getting the word out on your little dino expedition. To my left is Matthew T. Mossbrucker. He was recently on T-Rex Autopsy on the National Geographic Channel, which was an amazing, smelly, disgusting, wet... Uh, was it smelly? At times. At times it was. They they oh oh they played up the smelliness. Mm, they yeah. added special scents just to get us to react. I've changed so many diapers in my day that it didn't bother me, but everybody else has seemed to. Come. Should we explain the hat you're wearing? Just well, let me explain who you are first. Everyone knows. This guy is Doctor Bob, and everybody knows, so he doesn't need an introduction. So introduce my hat. It's a fine hat. It's your signature hat. You look uncomfortable with the hat. It's you guys got curves. Real hats have curves. Not necessarily. This is flat. Here, just may I? Here, let, let me let me work on your hat while, while you're hosting. Work make on the feel, hat. Make me feel useful am, in the background. It, am I? Is it supposed to get curved? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We can we can it's curve it. Rather clean. Should we rub some uh, red beds of dirt in it? Yeah. They're, they're making this a real dino hat. So right now we're in the museum. We're in the research department of the Morrison Museum. Uh, they're actually working on actual items from digs. You're digging up uh, an Apatosaurus Ajax muzzle. Yes, it's right behind me. It's the missing snout of Apatosaurus Ajax. It's a beautiful specimen. And Dr. Bob is working on a little Here animal. Goes. Oh, it looks like that. But 12 feet long. That's you, not actual size. But this is a Dimitrodon. It is indeed. You, but you said a Patasaurus. Well, that's what I'm working on. We oh. work on many things. You work on two different things at the same time? Absolutely. You can't multitask. Can you? Oh, give me your hand. That is genuine oh, Texas Red Beds rock. And you can eat it. If you put it, you should learn how to eat rock. Put it on your tongue. A little piece. Put it. What is? What, are, what am I doing? Just off on your tongue. 
did uh, this is a li literary show. I don't. I, I, it's not Fear Factor. Just put it on your tongue and let it dissolve, and that will tell you how much clay is there, how much soap. Does it feel slightly gritty? Slightly. And otherwise, pretty smooth. Pretty smooth. That's yeah. important. That tells you the current that carried the mud that buried this it's Demetrodon down. skeleton was moving very slowly. It wasn't a stream. It wasn't a river. It was a floodplain, and a little layer of of mud from the overflowing river gently crept across the floodplain and buried the skeleton in red dirt. In red mud. It wasn't red when it was buried. It was probably yellowish. These are oxidized iron. That tells you something else about the climate. It was a well drained. wasn't wet all year round. Hmm. It had a long dry season. And rocks that start yellowish when they're buried gradually lose water and become red. It's a rule. A ru rocks become red? When, when a, uh, a, a layer of sediment that has just buried your fossils that starts out yellow, that's hydrated iron oxide, a little like rust, over time, over millions of years, will lose a little bit of water and go from yellow to a red, hence the famous Texas or red beds. And the Texas red beds are in, are in North Texas above Amarillo, right? Uh, correct. It's where Oklahoma should be. Oklahoma shares the red beds. It goes across the boundary between the states. Okay. That's a good... And, and so that's a... So there's active digging going on. Absolutely. I spent all of the last two weeks actively digging. And how... Getting, getting bit by chiggers. And there's a lot of rain over there right now. That's why there are a lot of chiggers. Usually they bow out at the beginning of April, but now they'll get you. If, if I, I've never, I don't know anything about dinosaurs. If I wanted to go help out on a dig, can I? Absolutely. How? Next week. Just call me up. When the rain stopped, the Texas monsoon stops, we've got to go back in. We left lots of skeletons out there. And so you're actually digging up full skeletons? And yes. And, and so what's it what's it take to get out there besides just besides physically getting out there? Like, do you just let anybody that like Don't drives up? Don't be a fumble bum. A what now? A fumble bum. You've got delicate fingers. Mm -hmm. Did you make models when you were a child? Uh, yeah, I went to art school. Excellent. And were you into the sculptural arts as well as the graphic arts? Uh, no, mostly painting and uh, uh, kind. Of, I didn't really go into sculpture. Hold on, your hand like. Of course, I think with this hand. <laughs> That's not bad. That's all we need. Okay. Your nails are really clean. They are amazingly clean. Nails. Well, how do you do I, that? I, I, look, and look how soft my hands are. People always say I've got soft hands for for a, a boy of my age. How old um, are you? Uh, what year is it? It's um, June. June. Yeah. So that would be thirty. Four. Everyone's 34 or 35 this year, have you noticed? Yeah. I'm 36. And Colleen's 35. Colleen's 35. Yeah. And Chris, the, your opposite number, the curator at the Whiteside Museum in Texas, is 35. Wow. It's a good time to be mid-30s. I'm enjoying myself. I am too. We got comments in the chat room. Uh, Dr. Bacher is Dino Gandalf. Uh, would you say that's accurate? I want to be Dino Mickey Rourke. <laughs> Mickey Rourke? Yes. I think for this crowd, Dino Gandalf <laughs> is, is the right. In the movie <laughs> of, of my life, I want, to, I want to be played by Mickey Rourke. Well, I, I, everyone, people in the chat room want to congratulate you. Many people over the years have tried to get me to eat dirt. Uh, That's not dirt. And, and you just did. <laughs> but it was tasty clay. Tasty clay. If you want to... Talk to us. 530-64-FRODO is our number. 530-64-FRODO. You can call and you can text us. Text us because we can read it and then we can respond. Call if you want us to hear your voice. But I'm going to leave the hotline open and I'm going to leave the chat room open. One of the reasons I want to talk to you guys is because Tolkien's books have so many creatures. Mm -hmm. And Tolkien taught at Oxford he did. at the same time that the dinosaur, great dinosaur dig heyday was kind of happening in the 
20s and 30s and 40s. Oxford scholars, Oxford dons, began to dig really big fossils, including dinosaurs, in 1662. 1662? It's the oldest museum in Europe with dinosaurs. Would they, what, did they have a museum, dinosaur museum? Did they just had a fossil stuff? museum from 1662 and the long sequence of great scholars. The very first dinosaur bone to be carefully illustrated was illustrated in 1664, and it was the knee region, the, uh, the lower thigh bone of a megalosaur, a big carnivore. Hmm. So Oxford was on the ground floor, and they dug mammoths and mastodon, saber-toothed cats, giant ice age wolves, all manner of things. What? Uh, what what other entities were funding dinosaur digs at the time? Just the like Church of England. Nearly all museums began as parts of universities, which began as part of the church, either the Church of England or across the across the channel, mm -hmm. the Roman Catholic Church. So you can thank Orthodox Christianity for giving us the tradition of the university and thence the tradition of the museum. So, when Tolkien would have gone to school there as a, a young lad, mm -hmm. and then ended up teaching there, he would have already been surrounded by dinosaurs. Oxford had the longest history, tradition, of collecting fossils and thinking about them of any university. So, what, what, who were some of the, were there people well known? Oh, God, yeah. In the Mr. Jurassic, the guy who defined the Jurassic, the Reverend William Buckland starting in 1818, dug Jurassic fossils around Oxfordshire and beyond. And he, he laid out the evidence that the Jurassic was very long and had many slices of creation, each with its own species. And then he described in detail his first discovered meat-eating dinosaur, Megalosaurus, and the Guanodon, the Vegisaur, and the long-necked Polarosaurus, and beautiful Jurassic crocodile there to die for. <laughs> the, the, the crocodiles are my favorite part of the Jurassic World video game. They're the uh, Teleosaurus, which is the most famous British Jurassic crocodile, was Yuri Hainine, who would go out to sea and come back as an estuarine crocodile and gorgeous. They were complete specimens in the Oxford Museum. So, did, so was that kind of the start of, of dinosaur... Uh, Excitement? Absolutely. The Illustrated London News would do Sunday supplements of the many fossils that had been accumulated by Oxford scholars. So Tolkien is considered, we've talked about this on other shows, Tolkien is often considered as like a genius that worked in a vacuum. Bullshit. And, you know, they, it, it, of course he, he would, might, might have been inspired by his uh, war uh, experiences uh, in World War One. Yeah, but a lot of people say, oh, you know, he spent 30 years writing Middle Earth, so, you know, that it takes a long time to create. And, and one of the things that we, we have to believe is that if he was surrounded by the latest and greatest uh, research into prehistoric uh, discoveries, that must have influenced some of the creatures that he created. He was swimming in a sea of fossil knowledge at Oxford swimming in it. He couldn't avoid some of it seeping into his brain. Is there anything in Lord of the, any creatures that uh, uh, you think he just made up on his own? No. Or is everything no. based no. on No, it? that's nonsense. He was a scholar of philology, the evolution of language. He was a scholar of the evolution of myths, mostly Western European myths. He looked at the continuity of characters, continuity of tropes of figures of speech, of battles, of weapons. Had he had he been here with us, he would have shook his head. That's nonsense, young man. Of course, those who study culture try to understand the, the forces that flow through culture. So, uh, 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 yeah, uh, his, favorite, his favorite thing was Beowulf. You know, yes. The, the first dragon. Do you think a lot of uh, other people... No, no, it's not a dragon. It's a beast. It's a hairy beast. That's something else again. Explain. Beowulf is shown killing a dragon, as most heroes in medieval times in Western Europe did. But Grendel, the terrible monster that Beowulf slew, was not a dragon. It was a great big hairy thing, kind of half 
bear, clearly influenced by bears, and uh, half interior lineman of the Dallas Cowboys, a great big <laughs> muscular, athletic, hairy, 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 hairy. Have you read, uh, they just, last year, they just published Tolkien's Beowulf. Yes. With, with all his notes. Have, have you had a chance to look at that? Of course. I bought it the day it was at Barnes & Noble. Didn't you? Of course. Well, they sent us a copy, so oh, I didn't have to go. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it was a fascinating um, fascinating look at that. Because st- that was my, one of my, the- my thesis was about Beowulf and its impact on popular culture. University. What about the Green Knight? He takes his head off. What's that? What's that about? You, you know, uh, I want to. I, I wish I remembered more about what Tolkien said about that. But um, but we digress. But we digress. So, if if he if Tolkien is is surrounded by dinosaurs uh, over there, what types of dinosaurs are being discovered over here? In North America at, the same, at that time. Geez, from the 20s um, on, the American West was still producing tons of fossils, heading from Colorado and Wyoming and South Dakota out east to big museums uh, on the coast, chiefly the American Museum of Natural History. Also, the Smithsonian uh, in Washington, D.C. were getting fossils. Lots of big Jurassic dinosaurs and good skeletons of big meat eaters, too. Um, by the 1920s, we had a good skeleton of T-Rex. Here? Had, um, yeah, it's, it's from north of us. Um, but uh, um, these are all dinosaurs that were, were populating American museums and, and getting into the press, too. And one animal, in particular, Diplodocus, made a trip um, across the pond. And the cast of the animal still stands in the Natural History Museum of London today as an ambassador of uh, American paleontology. And it's much, much beloved at the Natural History Museum. So I'm sure Tolkien had seen that famous skeleton still mounted um, at the Natural History Museum. And that had to have some sort of an impact on him. Well, the, the fell beasts have the big, long, black necks. Do you, do you think that was the starting point for some of those? I, you know, I remember reading a fan letter a year ago or so, and uh, a fan had asked Tolkien if pterosaurs, pterodactyls, had inspired the fell beasts. And it turns out, um, he says they didn't, you know, that those were animals that he invented from uh, his own mythology, that they, they were not the inspiration. I so, find that invented? hard to believe. Yeah, that's just what he said. I'm just, I'm just reporting what the man himself wrote. Don't you think this reflects the battle of the two cultures, as it's been called? The, the long tradition of the humanities, and then the new tradition of science. And there was tension between science and humanity, big time in the 30s mm-hmm. and after the war. What, so they didn't want to give credit to the other? Well, the scientists, the new science departments, which started taking over Oxford and Cambridge and other universities, did look down their noses at the old humanities, learning Greek, learning Latin, uh, reading Virgil in the original Norwegian. I mean, the scientists were more about experiments, about astronomy, about mathematical models, and looking at the deep past with fossils. So there was a huge co- culture. In fact, it, there was a famous paper in the 1950s, The Battle of the Two Cultures, and it still goes on today. You see, in the Big Bang Theory, when, when poor Sheldon learns that the big grant money may in fact go to the English department, he says, oh, the humanities. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 you know, the, this is the thing that we run into, the letters. Cliff loves to quote from the letters. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've always thought that Tolkien was as great a marketer as yes. he was a writer. Yeah. You know, he was a tenured professor mm-hmm. at the most prestigious university, and there's a there's a level of polit- marketing yourself inside of the politics of an institution oh, yeah. like that, and especially if you're uh, uh, referencing science and 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 like the idea of saying that he created these creatures in a vacuum. There's no way. Can't be. Cannot be. He's surrounded by them. There, Oxford had among many other things. Parts of gigantic pterodactyls, huge ones, early Cretaceous ones, 
that were dug in the 1840s and monographed in the 1870s. And it was a wonderful, popular book by uh, Seely, S-E-E-L-E-Y, Seely, called Dragons of the Air. And it was available for a cheap price and sold extremely well. And how could, how could Tolkien have not known about this book and the popular portrayal of these real fossil Long necked dactyls. Long necked. Hey, long necked dactyls? Yes, long necked dactyls. How, how, how big of a wingspan are we talking? Look, a big ornithochiris would push 28, 30 feet. They're way big. The most commonly represented critters, though, that were dactyls at the time, um, from complete skeletons, were sparrow to hawk sized dactyls. Critters called pterodactylus and rampharynchus. And they both have fairly long necks. They really they do? do, especially pterodactylus. Long, elegant necks. The Jurassic period's the time of mostly small dactyls. You get into the Cretaceous, and something happens. They become gigantic. And uh, yeah. these are from English quarries. Mm. They were well known. They were in every textbook and in many a popular newspaper Sunday supplement. How could you avoid... Well, and, the, and Tolkien took pride in saying that this was a uniquely English mm -hmm. uh, uh, myth that he was trying to create based on English caricatures and English parts of society. So, do you think the creatures that he created in Middle-earth are, are based on English? There are old paintings, old as in 8th century, and engravings of English dragons with long necks and tiny little wings, and yet they fly. They're, they're powered by the imagination of the poets of the time. <laughs> and mammal teeth, too. You notice that? They have mammal dentition? Yeah. It's puzzling. But uh, I, I, I can't imagine that the real flying dragons of the English Cretaceous didn't tickle the imagination of, of Tolkien as it was describing the fell beasts. And if old English uh, art and literature describes small wings and Tolkien's flying beasts all had big huge, wings. Huge. Really big wings. They're biomechanically yeah. correct whereas most of the illustrations, the classic uh, um, illustrations of the knight dealing the death blow with his lance to the English dragon. The dragon may be pretty big but it's tiny, tiny little wings, mm -hmm. you know. The fell beasts are much more believable, and I have to infer they were they were inspired by these real fossils of big winged, strong winged. He had to. It, it had to be. Oh, yeah, so what? What about Smaug? It, you know, he describes Smaug as his armor is impenetrable. Do we have? Was there any discoveries? Many. Your your favorite Jurassic beast, the seagoing crocodiles, had armor plate over their entire bottom. Entire stomach and thorax. Wait, but how do we know that? Because crocodiles now they're soft on the belly. No, they are not. I can arrange for you to to wrestle an American alligator, punch them in the stomach. There's bone plates here. Yeah, they're bone plates. Really? Yes, they're armored top and bottom. Yeah, not only do they have a, a complete chest, a stern like we do, but from the end of their breastbone to their hips, there are rods of bone that stiffen the gut. Two layers of armor. Yeah. Yeah. We wouldn't lie to you. And and it, didn't you find some of those rods in the T-Rex? <laughs> and uh, yeah, we absolutely did. And T-Rex really does does have those. They're called gastrilia, and it's a basket that aids in the act of respiration, so T-Rex can breathe. Because T-Rex, like a bird, doesn't have a diaphragm that separates its lungs from the rest of the visceral cavity. So it's a, an anchor point for the tummy muscles. But beyond that, even more superficial towards the outside of the skin was a second layer of armor, great big bone plates that look like armor. They function like armor and they were known in uh, 1760 for a Jurassic crocodile found on the Dorset coast and by 1930 there were complete versions of these armored Jurassic so it, crocodiles. They were there and they were so well known that every museum was given plastic replicas of the English armored crocodiles. Mm -hmm. Plastic didn't exist in the 30s. Plaster. 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 Oh. Plaster. Plaster. No. So, 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 so uh, an armor 
an unpenetrable armor was just common knowledge at that point. Plus, there's another source, another literary source. The Book of Job talks about Lotan, Leviathan, this great crocodile-like beast that is cannot be penetrated by lance or harpoon or arrow. And it talks about the, the stomach region being like a potsherd. Well, a broken potsherd is a gently curved piece of pottery. These ar armor plates on the stomach are gently curved. And that mm. book, the book of Job, probably goes back to six, 700 B.C. and was influenced by the Egyptian experience of hunting the Nile crocodile with bronze arrows that would bounce off. <laughs> yeah. There are historic literary uh, antecedents of the, the armor-plated schmog, and there are fossil specimens that show armor-plated crocodiles. But even beyond um, crocs, think about one of the uh, the original trinity of dinosaurs. We had an armored dinosaur, Hyliosaurus, yeah, which is English, that was very famous, very popular. And there were good specimens at Oxford and London showing the armored belly. Mm. So Schmog, oh, yeah. Schmog fits the tradition of Job, a very old book of the Bible, which came, which was influenced by Ugaritic. Don't forget the Ugaritic sagas of 1200 BC, which mm -hmm. has armor-plated giant leviathans. So they must. So uh, all the way back then, they must have uh, been digging up the same bones and well, seeing this. Anyone who met the Nile crocodile and attempted to shoot it would learn very quickly it's impenetrable. So is there anything original about smell? Putting this together is original. <laughs> the genius is not having hallucination of something no one's ever seen. The genius is putting a th the parts together, the, the, the traditions together, the flow of science and the flow of uh, art. And he did that. That's the genius. So there, The guy did not do crack. No. No. It wasn't right <laughs> yet. No. <laughs> not yet. That, so someone in the chat room brought up a uh, Clashak Quarry. Is that how you say that? C L A S H A C H? Clashak. Didn't ring a bell. Uh, what age? Uh, uh, Clashak Quarry. Uh, they found dino footprints in a quarry where she grew up. Um, Who's she? Mrs. Focoena. Uh, Focoena in the chat room. Um, says uh, a local quarry found dino footprints. There are dino footprints yeah, all around, yeah. and they were first described in England mm -hmm. in 1818, in Oxfordshire. So, so Tolkien was in the center of all things great beasts. Yes, and, absolutely. And was it unique that his stories and C.S. Lewis's stories had these fantastical creatures? Not totally. There was a French novel about time traveling to the fossil past about 1874, but was not translated, to my knowledge, into English. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was Lost World, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, 1909, I believe. Okay, so that would have been like 20 years old when... Right, which was made into a movie in 1925, a success in both England and North America, with very good animation of real fell beast, dactyls and long-necked dinosaurs and sea crocodiles. Wait, so you're telling me ever since the turn of the century people have been writing books and selling the movie rights and having it being a successful movie? Yes. That's just... Willis O'Brien <laughs> did the animation, stop frame animation for Lost World 1925. And in many ways it's a better story than the novel um, Lost World 1909, which is a bit 